All right, it's six o'clock, so we'll call the meeting of the county board to order. Are we certified in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes, the agenda was posted on the 11th of December at 3 p.m. All right. Um, please join. I do have a flag over my right shoulder. If you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. The flag. The United, United, States, United States, States of America. To the Republic. To the which is one nation, 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 Supervisor Gruber. Supervisor Schneider. Here. Supervisor Montemayor. Here. Supervisor Clark. Here. Supervisor Nelson. Present. Here's Supervisor Prochek. In attendance. Supervisor Koch. Here. Supervisor Schobert. Here. Supervisor Brower. Here. Supervisor Jorgensen. Here. Supervisor Ziegelbauer. Present. Supervisor Nenig. Here. Supervisor Abler. Here. Supervisor Kulo. Here. Supervisor Damp. Present. Supervisor Wagner. Here. Supervisor Immel. Here. Supervisor OJ. Here. Supervisor Hoffman. Here. Supervisor Hilbelink. Here. Supervisor Bosman. Here. Supervisor Veldman. Here. Supervisor Gehring. Here. Supervisor Testrudi. Uh, let me give uh, one more uh, request for Supervisor Gruber. And if anyone sees him on the visual, I do not have that. Uh, and Supervisor Testrudi. Roger, right, I think you're still muted. Yeah, he's here. Roger? Yeah. Okay. Any visual on Supervisor Gruber? All right, there are 24 supervisors present. All right. As you know, we are meeting remotely tonight. As such, it poses a challenge to have each supervisor sign the resolutions and ordinances coming before the board. Unless there are any objections, I ask that the clerk affix electronic signatures or on the ordinances and resolutions reflecting each supervisor's vote at the committee level and on the county board as applicable. Are there any objections to having the county clerk do that? Nope. Okay, hearing no objections, the clerk is directed to affix the electronic signatures to those documents. Um, our next item of business is a consideration of Memorial, a memorial resolution pursuant to County Board Rule 2.13. This resolution will be brought to the floor for immediate action. Regarding um, honoring the life of former County Board Supervisor Curtis Neinheis, whereas former County Board Supervisor Curtis Neinheis passed away on November 21st, 2020, and whereas Mr. Neinheis served as County Board Supervisor for 10 years from 1978 to 1988, on the personnel committee from 1978 to 1986, 
on the Institutions Committee from 1982 to 1988, on the Law Committee from 1986 to 1988, and whereas Mr. Nienhuis also served as his community as citizen member of the Health and Human Services Board from 1989 to 2017, as clerk for the village of Oostburg, and both clerk and treasurer for the village of Kohler, as el elder and deaconate treasurer, and member and director of the Bethel or Orthodox Presbyterian Church, no. choir and men's chorus, as member of the Bethel Men's Society and the Pine Haven Men's Chorus, he taught Bible class and Sunday school for years, was Sunday school superintendent, serving also on the Oostburg Christian School Board, and he served his country in the U.S. Army at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, and in Verdun, France, as well as being part of the 32nd Division National Guard Band. And whereas Mr. Neinheis will be remembered for his ability to listen to people, taking his responsibilities seriously, effectively advocating for all Sheboygan County residents and putting service above self. Now, therefore, be it resolved that by passage of this resolution, the County Board herewith makes public its recognition of Mr. Neinheis's dedicated service to the citizens of the county and expresses its heartfelt sympathy to the family and friends and especially his wife, Elizabeth, and his children, David Neinheis, Paul Neinheis, Jill Ludens, Nancy Rohde, and Tim Neinheis. Be it further resolved that the clerk be directed to forward a copy of this resolution to Elizabeth, David Neinheis, Paul Neinheis, Jill Ludens, Nancy Rohde, and Tim Neinheis. Respectfully submitted this 15th day of December, 2020. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move that resolution. I'll second it. Thank you, Supervisor Hubelank, and thank Hoffman. you, thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Uh, on a voice vote, all those in favor of honoring the life of co former County Board Supervisor Curtis Nineheis, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carried. Thank you all. Next item of business is the approval of the November 3, 2020 journal. I'll, I'll move to approve, Mr. Chair. I will okay. second that. Was that Jacob Immel and Fran Damp? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any discussion or adjustments? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of the November 3rd, 2020 journal signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion carried. Consideration of appointment by chairperson. Chair, chairperson. Yeah, to Monarch Library Systems Board, William Gehring of Random Lake, reappointment. Henry Nelson moves, moves to approve. Thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the appointment, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Consideration of appointments by county administrator. We'll take these all as one. Sheboygan County Industrial Development and Revolving Loan Agency, Donald Hammond of Sheboygan Falls, Gary Maples of Sheboygan Falls, Tom Brickley of Sheboygan, and Gary Dalmas as an alternate from Sheboygan. I will make a motion to approve those appointments. Thank you, Supervisor Damp. Is there a second? Gehring, second. second. Thank you, Supervisor Gehring. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the appointments to the Industrial Development Revolving Loan Agency, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Presentation. Uh, Aaron Brault, Planning and Conservation Director, uh, giving a Planning and Conservation Department program updates. Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, I've asked to speak a little bit about Amsterdam Dunes and Sheboygan Marsh. If you recall, last year, I gave a similar presentation, so I'll give a few updates on, on those two properties. 
Uh, specifically, I'll talk a little bit about the mitigation bank, the non-mitigation bank at Amsterdam Dunes, and then the bypass gate dam and the new marsh building out at the marsh. So just to take a step back maybe for some of the new board members, um, why are mitigation banks there and, and what are they? So if there's a, a development, whether it be a, a private entity or a public entity and wetlands are affected, uh, laws throughout the nation state that you have to mitigate that disturbance to wetlands. Wetlands are important, they're nature sponge, uh, they clean water for us, filter out pollutants, slow water down during flooding. Um, so they're, they're pretty valuable. And what happens is if you affect it or affect a wetland during your project, uh, the typical mitigation ratio is one to one and a half. So if you're filling one acre of wetland for your project, uh, you typically have to mitigate one and a half additional acres somewhere else. So, um, there's mitigation banks set up where you can buy credits or you can buy credits from the DNR now, which is a newer program, uh, or you can create your own. Uh, not too many people choose the latter um, just because it's a, a long drawn out process. And the, the middle is, or the DNR, the in lieu fee program is second fiddle to mitigation banks. So the priority is mitigation banks. So, a few years back, we were paying a lot of money for mitigation credits and still continue to pay a lot of money for mitigation credits. So we started to look at this as an option for the county to have our own bank. Um, I reported last year uh, at this time that we had to do some additional archeological digs, which we did in December last year. We resubmitted that additional information uh, early in the year and then uh, waited until about end of July, early August to hear back from the three agencies we deal with, which are the CORE, uh, EPA, and the DNR. We heard back, knock on wood, we only had four comments this time, which was great, and they were pretty minimal comments. Um, so things that are currently moving along pretty nicely. Um, the last update I had from the CORE was that it is in the final approval stages at, at the CORE. Um, so one of those comments, we had to address was last year when I reported to you, uh, we were proposing 31.9 credits. We lost 0.14 credits because we had to subtract out the actual stream width um, of the intermittent streams in the property. So uh, we're down to 31.7 credits rather than the 31.9 I reported to you last year. The good news with some of the delays that we've had in getting this approved is that if you recall, when we first started talking about this, credits were going for fifty, sixty, seventy thousand uh, dollars. They're currently going for eighty to one hundred and ten thousand dollars right now. So we, we've had a little benefit in having to wait for approvals. However, if we take a conservative estimate of seventy thousand dollars a credit, that gives us about two point two. Um, in revenue versus an expense estimate currently at about 700,000. So that's a difference of about 1.5 million uh, that we'll be able to put into additional conservation practices at the property, uh, maybe develop some trails and things like that over time. So the next steps, hopefully again, knock on wood, uh, it seems to be that we're in the, the final stages of approval at the core. Uh, so hoping for that here in the next uh, month or two, uh, we'd have some paperwork to complete after that, our financial assurance and the easement that'll go on the property. Uh, that'll be hopefully completed early spring, late winter. And then depending on when we get all those approvals, uh, hopefully construction starts uh, spring or fall. And that'll depend on where we are in the planting season. You typically don't want to start planting things, um, you know, that early June period when things start to warm up and you don't want to plant until things start to cool down, but before freezing. So, um, so knock on wood, hopefully uh, we'll be moving dirt um, come uh, 2021. Other notes on the property, uh, again, more so for the new members of the board, um, but our acquisition costs have fully been accounted for, so that's good news. 
Um, once the bank is approved, uh, we can sell up to 10% of the credits up front before we start moving dirt or planting anything. That gives us some positive cash flow up front to uh, begin the uh, construction. And then, no surprise, uh, there's no beach left on the property. So between 14 and, and 20, uh, we've lost about 185 feet of, of beach there. And, and that's up and down the lakeshore, so uh, we're not the only one dealing with that. So moving on to the non-mitigation bank, I don't know if you can see my arrow or not, but the middle mm -hmm. portion of the property is where the mitigation bank is, and then these colored areas are the non-mitigation bank. So we started to do some restoration work in non-mitigation, starting back in probably 15 or 16, and we continue to plug along um, on, the, on that area of the property. The biggest effort that we've had uh, so far and, and most recently was trying to repopulate or reforest the property. So if we recall back in 19, uh, we did some ash logging while there was still some value in the timber. And uh, some of the areas of that property, unfortunately, like many parts of the county are or were about 80 to 90 percent ash. So um, a lot of our focus, like I said, in the last uh, year or two has been uh, trying to set the next generation up for success on the property. So we've planted about 7,000 trees or more um, on different or various parts of the property. So now moving to the marsh, I'll start with the bad and then hopefully get to the good. Um, so no doubt we've had four or five of the wettest years on record these past few years. Um, we've been trying to draw down the marsh since 2017, and because of those high or the high water we've been experiencing, uh, we've had no success. So the last drawdown we had was 2011. Our management plan calls for a drawdown every five years, or as ecological indicators warrant. And our primarily eco, or our primary ecological indicator are bog. And as you all know, and, and perhaps some of the new members of the county board don't know, but um, that causes a big issue for us behind the dam. It clogs up the dam, clogs up the boat landing and whatnot. And then we have to remove them. And every five years, or the last five years, uh, we've averaged about $47,000, unfortunately, in removal costs. Since 1993, when the department started keeping these uh, records, uh, it's about 17 and a half. And after a drawdown, and this is why drawdowns are important, we don't see very many bog removals at all. Um, so we average about 1,100 in a three-year period after uh, a drawdown. And what the drawdown does is it allows that vegetation to root better. The marsh is 134-square-mile uh, watershed that backs up to that 60-foot dam. So if eastern Fond du Lac County gets the interrain, that water level rises pretty rapidly and it tears up the vegetation. So the goal of the drawdown is to have that vegetation root a little bit better and then uh, we don't see the large influxes of cattails, you know, until usually about year four, year five, somewhere in there. And that's why we have in our management plan that we want to draw down every five years. So this just is a graph that shows from 93 to uh, current times. And you can see after the drawdown, we have the valley. And then if we're not able to draw down, um, then uh, we get these peaks. And we're really not able to draw down because we don't have a good water control structure out there. We have a five foot bypass tube. Um, you've probably heard me say this before, but if Lambeau Field was filled up with water, that'd be like trying to drain it with a straw. So it takes about a good month without any kind of precipitation event uh, to actually draw down the marsh. Um, so it, it, it's really a, a gamble. Like I said, we've been trying to draw it down since 2017 and, and we've had no luck. So the good, um, if you recall in 18, the bypass gate failed and we uh, spent 19 uh, working on the uh, engineering and the permitting to put the new one in. Uh, that project was completed in 2020, so now we actually have a control structure, whereas before it was wide open, although it's been wide open pretty much since the install to try to draw it down. Um, we're looking at that new dam. Uh, for some of the new board members, we're looking at that to be able to be, be, able to be better, better pass more water. 
and and also keep it drawn down when it's drawn down. A lot of issues we have once we finally get it drawn down. Again, if we get a little bit of rain, it fills right back up, and and we're back to square one. Um, so we're still aiming for a 23 construction on that. Um, we have a million dollar ask at the DNR in their current budget uh, proposal that's looking pretty good at this point. We've had a hundred thousand dollar pledge from the local conservation association. Ducks Unlimited is looking at uh, putting some money towards it. And um, hopefully if we can cob together enough funds, uh, we're looking at starting design in 2021. The new building uh, is moving along. Uh, no major hiccups uh, to date on that project. Um, the walls have started to go up. So here's just a few pictures of the footings and, and walls going up. And then that tree in the top left corner, if you recall some of the, or the plans for the building, it's actually gonna be held up by trees in a, in a lot of areas. And this tree here is, the, they call it the glory tree, and that's the tree that's gonna be in the atrium. So that was harvested from the site, so that'll be a nice story. Uh, you can see it's an ash tree. I don't know if you can see too well, but you can see all the little uh, channels and stuff from the critters that ate it and killed it. Um, but it's a solid tree. Uh, we counted 115 rings, plus or minus. So it's been there quite some time. And then this is hopefully what it'll look like once it gets done. Uh, the colors will be a little different, but that's that's sort of the gist of what the building will look like when it's done. So with that, uh, that's what I have for you this evening, and I'll entertain any questions you may have. Does anybody have anything they want to ask Aaron Brault? I do. Aaron, what when we took down the trees and uh, along the lake, what trees did we plant? Uh, so again, we're trying to set the next generation up for success. So we've planted right. a variety of species. So it's not just one monoculture monoculture species uh, like we pretty much had out there. Um, so they provide or planted a lot of different types of oak, swamp white oak. Um, some red oak, white oak, uh, different types of maples, um, some beech, I think. So a variety of species. Great. <clears throat> there Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? If not, thank you very much, Aaron. Yep, thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Next is public addresses. <clears throat> All right. We have uh, Jessica Huss of uh, Sheboygan speaking uh, uh, combat perspective of COVID-19. Uh, Jessica Huss, 1904 North 23rd Street, Sheboygan. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Since very early on, COVID-19 has been compared to war with healthcare workers serving on the front lines. I'm a combat vet and I would like to share my perspective on COVID-19 as it relates to war. I served with the 32nd Military Police Company in Baghdad, Iraq from 2003 to 2004. Our mission was to provide area security and to train the new Iraqi police force. We reported for duty on March 15, 2003, and the war began March 18th. When we arrived in Baghdad in early May, the U.S. military was not ready for us to be there. Like with COVID-19, they had very little information to share with us about the area or about our enemy. We lived in the remains of a compound that was targeted in the initial air attacks. By structurally sound, we had no windows, plumbing, or electricity. Food was rationed and we drank hot bottled water. The area was hostile and we were ill-equipped and unprepared. Due to a manufacturer shortage, we didn't have plates in our vests for the first three months we were in Iraq, but even without plates, we still wore our vests. When it's a life or death situation and the odds are not in your favor, you use whatever you have available to you to improve those odds. When the plates arrived in July, the average temperature in Baghdad was 140 degrees. With the plates, our vests weighed approximately 50 pounds. It was uncomfortable, hot, and we had to consume a lot of water and salt to keep from becoming dehydrated. We knew there was no guarantee by wearing a vest and being comfortable and being uncomfortable that it would save our lives when we needed it to. Yet, I don't think it ever crossed anyone's minds just not to wear it. It's a memory that has come to my mind when I hear people say that wearing a mask is unconstitutional, uncomfortable, or unsafe. I don't like wearing masks either, but I personally put it in the same category as wearing clothes in public. No shoes, no shirt, no mask, no service. Just like wearing a seatbelt when you drive or wearing a helmet when you ride a bike. 
We are a divided nation and it has made us weak. Everyone has picked a team and most are passionate about where they stand. I'm not here tonight to claim that anyone is right or wrong, but the reality is with COVID-19, someone is wrong. With that in mind, I'd like to talk about the consequences for each side. I believe that by wearing a mask and spending more time at home, I am protecting myself. If I am wrong, worst case scenario is I missed a few social events, celebrated holidays a little bit differently, and perhaps gained a little bit of weight. <laughs> it's it's true that mental health um, has declined and our local economy has taken a fall. But with our continued support, I believe that they can recover. But what are the consequences for those who do not believe in COVID-19 and are refusing to follow the recommendations? You could end up in a hospital, on a ventilator, with long-term damage. You could die. You don't recover from that. I wish that people would stop and think a little bit more about the risks that they are taking and decide if it's really worth it. I know that it feels like this is never going to end. I didn't think Iraq was ever going to end either. Our deployment was made up of three sets of orders with the last set coming nine days before we were supposed to go home. I was angry and I was frustrated. I had everything set up to go back home. All I had to do was get on a plane, but they just wouldn't let me. But eventually it did end and this will too. Vaccines have been developed, FDA approval obtained, and they are en route to our area. The end is in sight, but that doesn't mean it's time to let your guard down. This is the part where we tend to become the most complacent and you don't want to start f stop fighting the war until it is really over. Mask up, stay home, and maybe start some new holiday traditions this year. I promise you this will be a memory you look back on for the rest of your lives. A year and a half ago, or a year and a half after coming home, the 32nd Military Police Company was awarded the Valorous Unit Award. It is the third highest honor you can receive from the White House and is equivalent to the Silver Star. This accomplishment is recognized in 2005 Wisconsin State Assembly in Gross Resolution Number 44, signed and dated December 15, 2005. Coincidentally, 15 years ago today. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are differing opinions about why we received this high honor. We were on a high-profile mission with tremendous odds to overcome, but I believe being a National Guard unit was our strength as we were naturally diverse. Yes, we had different ages, races, and genders, but we also had different civilian jobs, which our leadership team, to their credit, used to our advantage. Additionally, if you read the resolution, there's a statement that talks specifically about our compassion for the Iraqi people, about our kindness. Many of you present today have taken a little bit of fire from your constituents this year. I think if you've never had to pioneer your way through a situation like this, it can be really difficult to understand. It isn't always about finding a way, because in some cases, there just isn't one. You have to create it. It takes courage and it takes grit. I came here tonight to share a slightly different perspective and to tell you that I think you've all done an outstanding job navigating your way through this battle. You are diversified by collaborating with different organizations, healthcare, the school district, and the Chamber of Commerce, to name a few. Your communication has been transparent and stellar. You showed respect by filing Ordinance 3 despite your personal opinions, and even more, you stood up for each other when you felt like they were being attacked. In my opinion, you have taken the same approach my leadership team took in our unprecedented situa precedent situation, which was declared to be a success. It is a proven approach. Thank you to all of our elected officials, those appointed by our elected officials, public health staff, and of course the healthcare workers if you're listening. None of this has been easy and I sincerely appreciate all your service. Thank you for your time. Be safe, be well, and be kind. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Um, next is letters, communications, and announcements. There are none. Very good. County Administrator's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. I want to express my sincere appreciation to everyone who's been working together to slow the spread of COVID-19, support our healthcare workers, and keep our businesses and schools open. Although it is really encouraging that vaccines are on the way, as Ms. Jessica Huss just stated, now is not the time to let our guard down. As you know, we have experienced a steady increase in positive COVID-19 cases in Sheboygan County, the state, and our country. And sadly, a lot of people have died. My heartfelt thoughts and prayers to families that have suffered such a terrible loss, <clears throat> people that continue to experience serious health concerns, are unemployed and may be struggling to put food on their table. 
I am also concerned about our healthcare workers and our first responders who continue to put themselves in harm's way in order to help all of us. The ongoing battle with this deadly virus has impacted all of us, but certainly some have felt the brunt of it more than others. We should all show our support and concern by taking some personal responsibility to defeat this horrible virus. This is no hoax, and it is worse than the flu. It is an understatement to say a lot has happened since March, when our president, governor, and the Sheboygan County Board all declared a national, state, and local state of emergency. Since March, Sheboygan County's confirmed COVID cases climbed from 1 to 10,406. 82 people have died. The Wisconsin confirmed case count is now at 442,396 with over 4,100 COVID related deaths. Nationally, more than 16 million people have contracted the virus and over 300,000 people have died. Thank goodness. Vaccines are on the way. We learned just yesterday, Wisconsin received its first shipment. As you might expect, healthcare workers will be among the first immunized, followed by long-term care nursing home staff and residents. As an employer, Sheboygan County is not planning to require our staff to be vaccinated, but we do intend to follow the advice of health professionals and getting everyone vaccinated will certainly be encouraged. We continue to have a pandemic administrative panel that's been meeting since March. Every Monday morning, it's comprised of representatives from our area hospitals and clinics, nursing homes, first responders, public health professionals, law enforcement, corrections, schools and universities, county board supervisors and city and county administration. Our public health officer, Star Grossman, leads and facilitates the meeting and provides state and local updates. We also report on personal protective equipment, testing opportunities, hospital capacity, long-term care considerations, jail and corrections, emergency services, school system challenges, vaccine plan, and how we can effectively share information with the public. As you well know, our hospital bed capacity is a key indicator of how prevalent this virus is. In our Southeast region, hospital and ICU bed use continues to hover right around 90% capacity. We were pleased to hear just this Monday that our local hospitals have dipped below that a little bit, but it continues to be at a very high rate. And of course, if there were if there was some mass accident or something like that in the community that could really put a strain on our ability to care for people. Another area of focus of late that the pandemic administrative panel discussed was our messaging. A few weeks ago, there was a feeling that maybe our messaging was growing a little stagnant. People were growing numb to the data. And of course, we're struggling to reach some people. Even at this time, we continue to struggle to reach some people and encourage them to be part of the solution. So to that end, we discuss what can we do differently? And one of the suggestions, and I want to thank and acknowledge Vicki Schneider for suggesting it, was to develop a public service announcement. We talked about that after the meeting, and I'm very pleased to, to share that David Kohler, Louis Gentine, Michael Super, again from Kohler Company, Sargento, and Johnsonville, our representative Terry Kotzma, Chairman Vern Koch, a doctor, a nurse. Uh, we put together a diverse group of leaders, pillars in our community, to encourage the community to step up and be part of the solution to obviously social distance, wear masks in public, and again, help slow the spread of COVID. 
And, I, and again, it was heartwarming for me personally to reach out to these individuals and every single person we asked to participate agreed to do so in very short order. That public service announcement is gonna be coming out before Christmas. We also are going to improve our messaging through the use of more billboards. We've had two billboards to date. We're gonna increase that to 14. And I wanna thank a number of you who submitted photos in particular Supervisor Marilyn Montemayor. Uh, we have selected our, our photos. We'll be again, going up on 14 billboards. We hope to get that done before Christmas as well. And then uh, updating our website because we receive far more than we can use. We further engaged our first responders. You know, our first responders are just incredible. And the demands that our police officers, sheriff's deputies, firefighters that they have on them, uh, you never know what each day is gonna bring, but there's a lot going on. Yet, uh, to their credit, uh, they're going to now be more proactive and working with businesses and individuals as time permits to share information, to engage and to encourage people to take precautions, to be safe and, uh, and for a business to put up signage. And again, making sure that people are wearing masks and being part of the solution. So we appreciate their, their teamwork in this process of sharing information and encouraging people to step up. I also want to give a shout out to the Sheboygan Press and Plymouth Review. They've really stepped up to help us disseminate information. The Plymouth Review is doing it routinely now with data we provide directly from public health. And the Sheboygan Press, you may have noticed, is doing a lot more personal stories, which I know certainly resonate with me and I think resonate with, with people if, if the numbers don't. We've seen incremental progress. I mean, I'm sure everyone agrees that if you go to a fleet farm or many other stores at this point, most people are wearing masks and we appreciate the incremental progress we've seen and more and more people stepping up to take some personal responsibility and be part of the solution. The National Guard continues to test at our Aging and Disability Resource Center every Wednesday and Friday. That took some work for us to get that lined up and it also took additional work to have that extended now through March of 2021. So we're feeling good about that. We continue to work with our state and federal legislators regarding additional COVID funding. The CARES Act or Route to Recovery funding has pretty much been utilized and we're hoping for another round. As you know, there's negotiations going on at the federal level Yesterday, we received an update from the Wisconsin Counties Association and NACO, and it continues to be up in the air on whether or not they're going to include funding for state and local government. They, they should. We spent over $4 million in response to COVID over the last eight, 10 months, and it's not going to go away in January. We're going to continue to need some help. We're working on state budget issue papers internally as we a ramp up with our own state budget development process. So that's in play, working with the executive committee, our department heads. And finally, I wanted to, I wanted to end on a little lighter note. It is the season. We just had a Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas is ahead. And uh, every year my mom writes a, a Christmas letter that may be kind of an old fashioned thing for people to do nowadays, but she always does so. And she, it's short and sweet, but she gives a little update. And this year she wrote, and it made me chuckle, and I hope it does you too. She wrote, if 2020 were a drink, if 2020 were a drink, it would be a colonoscopy prep. <laughs> and I, I, as a retired school teacher, I was a little surprised just to see it in her Christmas letter, but uh, that's what she wrote. And, and I'll readily admit that the other day I was feeling a little downhearted, you know, about Thanksgiving, not getting together with as much family and Christmas, obviously we're gonna keep it small, just our children. And, um, you know, it was just feeling a little downhearted and, and perhaps many of you can, can uh, empathize with that. And I opened up a Christmas card from Charlie Conrardi. As many of you know, Charlie served on the county board from April 1994 to April of 2020, and he's 91 years of age. And Charlie's Christmas card has a photo of him wearing a Wisconsin Badger cap with the caption, grateful now more than ever. 
a simple, positive, and powerful message from a well-respected and admired man who has seen and experienced a lot in his life. Inspired by Charlie, I found a pen and paper and reflected on what I have learned and appreciate now more than ever. You know, I'm so grateful for my parents, my wife, my children, my extended family, and I'm sure like many of us, will never take a family reunion for granted again. I'm grateful that this fall I got to spend a week with my dad. Never done that. Whole week. We drove west together and, and went on an elk hunt together. And my dad's 81. Uh, those days are numbered, but it was a wonderful and safe trip together. I'm grateful for my health, my friends, my hardworking, caring, and dedicated coworkers. I'm grateful for our incredible public health professionals and direct care givers. I'm grateful for our law enforcement, our first responders, and everyone who puts themselves in harm's way to help keep our community safe. I'm grateful for our school districts and business owners for all they are doing to help protect their coworkers and people they serve. I'm grateful for our teachers and parents who work so hard to educate our children, our future leaders. I'm grateful for everyone who has taken some personal responsibility to help slow the spread of COVID-19 and show empathy and compassion for those who are sick or who have lost a loved one. I'm grateful for our local, state, and federal elected officials who strive to find common ground and problem solve to make our communities and country even stronger. I'm so grateful for all of our nonprofit organizations and places of worship that focus on lifting people up and offering a helping hand. I'm grateful for people who are kind, considerate, and look for the good in others. And I'm grateful to have worked with and know people like Charlie Conrardi. I hope and pray that 2021 will be a year we can all look in the mirror and take some satisfaction that we work together to defeat COVID-19. And that this time next year, we'll all have one of the most joyful Thanksgivings, Christmas and New Year holiday celebrations ever surrounded by family and friends. And with that, I hope everyone has a safe, Merry Christmas, and New Year, and thank you all members of the county board and people participating in this meeting this evening for all that you have done and continue to do to help uh, keep our community safe. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Administrator Payne. For the uh, following, following resolution and ordinance that we'll be voting on this evening, we will be use a voice vote. If there is opposition to one of them, then we'll do a roll call vote. All right. So consideration of committee report from the executive committee. Resolution number 19 regarding declaring of official intent to reimburse expenditures from proceeds of borrowing recommendation to adopt. Uh, is that a motion, Supervisor Gearing? Gearing moves to adopt. Sorry, didn't have the speaker on. <laughs> Wagner, you, Wagner, will, Wagner will second. Thank you, Supervisor Wagner. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing no discussion, all those in favor of Resolution 19 say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Consideration of committee report from the law committee. Ordinance number six regarding establishing speed zone on County Roads A and J, Town of Rhine, County Road S, Town of Scott, County Road TT, Town of Sheboygan Falls. Committee recommendation to enact. All right. Supervisor Hoffman. I move to adopt. Thank you, Supervisor Hoffman. Is there a second? Supervisor Immel? 
I'll second Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll second that motion. Thank you, Supervisor Immel. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, all those in favor of ordinance number six say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Then I will hand over the gavel or computer mouse to Supervisor Ziegelbauer. Good evening to you all. Resolutions introduced. Resolution number 21. From the Finance Committee regarding disallowance of bus claim against Sheboygan County. Resolution number 21 will be referred to Executive Committee. Resolution number 22. From Human Resources Committee regarding authorizing Human Resources Committee to enter into the labor contract with Sheboygan County Law Enforcement Employees Association. Resolution number 22 will be referred to Finance. Resolution number 23. From the Law Committee regarding adopting updated County All Hazards Mitigation Plan. Resolution number 23 will be referred to Executive. Resolution number 24. From the Transportation Committee regarding petitioning the Secretary of Transportation for Airport Improvement Aid. Resolution number 24 will be referred to Finance. Ordinance is introduced. Ordinance number seven. From the Executive Committee regarding renumbering Chapter 8, Sheboygan County Industrial Development and Revolving Loan Agency to Chapter 9. Resolu uh, ordinance number seven will be referred to finance. Uh, Supervisor Testrudy, could you help me with the next order of business, please? Is Roger here today? He was. I believe. I believe his uh, is. He's muted. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I move to adjourn. Thank you, Supervisor Testrudy. Is there a second? A second that, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Immo. All those in favor. Aye. 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 We stand adjourned. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas everyone. Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, everybody.